find rest as you listen to this peaceful bedtime story. For more Bible stories that bring you refreshing sleep, download the Abide app in the iTunes or Google Play Store. The story of Easter, as we read it in the Bible, gives us a rare opportunity to explore the thoughts, feelings, and reactions of many people in the first century church, including Jesus himself. The historical context found in these verses gives us exact times, dates, and sequences of the events during Passion Week. Thanks to the beautiful, detailed writings found in the Gospels, we can pray through the precise chronology every day leading up to the cross. But for now, our passage to the cross begins seven days before. As you begin, settle into the presence of God as we let Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John guide us. Close your eyes and use the imagination of the Spirit within you. Be centered and present in the city of Jerusalem in the time of Jesus. Imagine it's Sunday morning, a week before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. To you, as a first century Jew, it's the tenth day of the month of Nizan. It's Easter week, but you don't know that. You don't realize it yet, but the week ahead of you will change everything. The next seven days will quite literally change how you define time. Everything will be defined by before and after what happens this week. But you don't know that yet. So imagine that you arrived in Jerusalem last night in time for the Passover celebration this week. Days walking with your family and several close friends. You're filthy, dusty. Your feet are burning. You couldn't sleep last night. You're not sure whether it's from the journey or something else. Thoughts were invading your mind. But either way, you crawled out of bed and climbed up to the top of the Mount of Olives to watch the morning sun slowly bring light to the city of David. But more than the sun bringing light to the city, you are secretly hoping it brings light to your soul too. Hoping for peace. Hoping for salvation. You're hoping for hope. The sun is at your back as you look west, across the valley to the beautiful eastern gate of Jerusalem. The morning sun just starting to glisten off Herod's temple as you look down over the city. You see priests walking through the courtyard far below, going about their daily routine and rituals. Vendors and money changers are setting up their tables, and families are starting to arrive in the very early morning before the crowds of Passover. Looking down over the city, you close your eyes in prayer as the week begins. You whisper the Shema prayer from Deuteronomy 6, just as countless generations of your family have done before you since the exile. Hear, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed be the name of our God and His glorious kingdom forever and ever. Let the words that God commands to me be in my heart. Help me teach His words diligently to my children, family, and friends. Help me speak of them when I'm at home and when I walk along the way, when I lie down, and when I rise up. Amen and amen. You keep your eyes closed for another moment as you reflect on the Lord God. Meditate on a greater cause for a few more moments, something bigger than you, something beyond yourself. You open your eyes slowly and softly. Squinting, you look down the path and see two men walking up towards you. Walking with a donkey and a colt in tow, you recognize them. They are clearly the disciples of a rabbi. 
you greet them as they pass. Where are you going with a donkey and a colt so early this morning, you ask? Our rabbi told us to go into town and get it for him. He says he needs them this morning. What's your rabbi's name, you ask? Rabbi Jesus, they respond. A chill runs down your spine. You've heard of this rabbi, of his teachings, his miracles, his message of hope, forgiveness, love, and mercy. Some are saying he could be the Messiah. Could he be the one, the king? And will you get a chance to see him this week? Your mind drifts for a moment. What if he is the one? What if he is? How will you feel seeing him? What will you say to him if he stops? For several moments, your mind drifts towards thoughts of seeing Jesus. What do you want to say to him when you see him? Losing track of time and your thoughts, you are suddenly startled by a crowd coming up over the Mount of Olives behind you, walking up from the city of Bethany and Bethpage. You recognize the two men that passed you before. Now they have ten other men with them, twelve in all, and a man is with them riding the donkey they had found. Is that him? Wait, this scene looks familiar. Yes, you remember your father and grandfather telling you this story. It's from the prophet Zechariah. He said a king is coming. He will be humble. He will be riding on a donkey and colt. And here it is, playing out right in front of you. Your heart is racing. It's pounding in your chest. As he passes, the rabbi looks down at you, through you. His eyes are piercing your soul. You can't even breathe. You surely can't speak. He and his followers move on in silence. Why didn't you say something to him? He stared right at you. You've dreamed of this moment since you were a child, and now you've missed it. What would you have said to him if you had the courage? You take a moment and imagine what you would tell him if you had the chance again. What do you want to yell out at him as he rides by? You slowly stand and follow them into the city. How can you not? Walking along the rocky path, you approach the eastern gate of Jerusalem. Many people saw him coming and spread their clothes on the road. Others put palm branches down, which they had cut from trees. Some people walked ahead of the rabbi, and others, like you, follow behind. But everyone is shouting, Hooray for the Son of David! God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord! Hooray for God in heaven above! Suddenly, a stranger grabs your arm from behind, and he asks you, Who can this be? Who is he? Is he the Rabbi Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee? You freeze for a moment. What's your answer? Consider your answer for a moment. Who is he? You follow Jesus and his disciples further into the city, towards the temple. He leaves the crowds and the cheering behind as he enters the temple court. You see him stop and slowly climb off the donkey. He's whispering, murmuring. You can't quite hear him, so you move a little closer. You see tears in his eyes as he looks into the courtyard. No one recognizes him. No one stops. As he looks at the priests, the vendors, the money changers, 
he begins to cry. You hear him whisper, whisper a prayer for those around him. He says, How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace, but now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not recognize it when God visited you. Who is he talking to? You feel his words pierce your own heart. Are you standing in the presence of the Messiah? the Son of God. Do you recognize Him being God? How will you know? You close your eyes in prayer again as you consider being in the very presence of God. You watch as Jesus climbs back up on the donkey. It's already late. So he leaves the courtyard through the east gate and back out to the town of Bethany with the twelve to lodge there for the night. You can't believe what you've just witnessed. You know today will be a day you will never forget. As you walk back in the dark to your family, you are already mentally making plans to wake up early and wait for Jesus to come back into the city tomorrow morning again. You softly whisper the Shema, as you watch Jesus leave. Hear, Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed be the name of our God and His glorious kingdom forever and ever. Let the words that God commands to me be in my heart. Help me teach His words diligently to my children, to my family and friends. Help me speak of them when I am at home and when I walk along the way, when I lie down, and when I rise up. Amen and amen. You can't wait to rise up in the morning to see what God will bring. You have a feeling your life will never be the same, and you are ready for that change. You've been secretly aching for that change, and maybe, just maybe, this rabbi is bringing that change, real transformation. You saw it in his eyes today, Maybe you will see it tomorrow, too. You know you will be up all night waiting for the dawn when you can see him again. It's Monday morning. You could barely sleep thinking about everything you saw and heard yesterday. You snuck out of the house quietly so as not to awake your family. And through the dark, you found your way once again to the top of the Mount of Olives, in the dead of night, searching for the light of day. That feels just about right. You find and sit at the base of a cedar tree as you watch the early rays of the sun peeking over the eastern horizon, over the cities of Bethany and Bethpage. Somewhere down there, Rabbi Jesus and his disciples are waking up. You hope you've chosen the right path to see them pass by again. You take a deep breath and whisper your morning prayer. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Blessed be the name of our God and his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Let the words that God commands to me be in my heart. Help me teach his words diligently to my children and my family and my friends. Help me speak of them when I'm at home and when I walk along the way and when I lie down and when I rise up. Amen and amen. You ponder for another few moments the events of yesterday. Had you seen the Lord, your God? Were you in his presence? Had you met the Messiah? What would today bring? You pause in deeper prayers of reflection for just a few more moments.
As you end your prayer, you hear voices. Peering through the warm early morning light, you see movement through the trees. Men walking up the trail towards you, walking in pairs, talking. You count six pairs of men, twelve in all, and a thirteenth walking in their midst. Your heart starts to race again. It's the rabbi and his disciples. It's Rabbi Jesus again. And you are frozen as they walk by. They stop near you, and you hear Jesus mention that he's hungry. The disciples look at each other, confused. Did any of them bring food? You realize in your own excitement that you hadn't eaten either. You watch as Jesus walks over to a fig tree to see if there are any figs on the tree. But there were not any, because it wasn't the season for figs. He seems disappointed to have found only leaves and no figs. So he told the tree, You will never again grow any fruit. Right then, the fig tree dried up. Right then, right in front of the disciples' eyes, right in front of yours. Who has that kind of power? Who has that kind of command over nature with just a word? You close your eyes in prayer as you consider what you just saw. Who is this rabbi? As they continue on their way, you follow them quietly. How can you not continue following this man? What more will you see? What more will you learn? Soon you pass through the eastern gate of Jerusalem and into the temple court with them. The crowds have already begun to form. The temple priests are busy with their duties and vendors selling animals to be sacrificed and tables of money changers taking advantage of poor families, arriving with the wrong kind of money. Suddenly, you see Jesus stop. You see the same look in his eyes as when he looked at the fig tree. Then, without a word, the rabbi takes off running towards the vendors and money changers. Clearly, he is set on driving out all those selling and buying in the temple courtyard. He overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who are selling pigeons to sacrifice. The crowd and the priests are stunned as he tells them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Everyone is stunned. What did he just say? Did he say his house? shall be called a house of prayer, His house? I thought it was God's house, God's temple. Is He saying that He's God? That He is the Messiah? Could this be His house? Could this all be His? Could all of this include me? You close your eyes to ponder Him. Could it be true? After the commotion, a divine stillness falls over the temple court. No one knows how to respond at first. There's an awkward silence for several moments. Then you hear the chief priests and the scribes begin talking amongst themselves. They are obviously seeking a way to destroy him, but the crowd is astonished at his teaching. They are hanging on his words. The priests and the scribes are afraid of him, but they can't find anything they can do about it. You aren't sure who is more afraid of who, You look at the faces of the priests and the scribes. What do you see? Are they more afraid of Jesus or the people in the crowd? Then you look at the crowd. What do you see? In the midst of the confusion, the only one that seems to know who he is and why he is there is this rabbi from Bethlehem. 
Rabbi Jesus, you slowly walk towards him, feeling his strength, his confidence, and his humility. Even as you walk towards him, you close your eyes. How do you feel as you approach him? With your eyes closed, you hear the world around you become still and quiet as you focus on this humble rabbi. Imagine that now. As you slowly and softly open your eyes, you realize you've lost all track of time. It's late now. You remember it was 24 hours ago you were standing in this very spot. You've learned and seen so much. As you did yesterday, you watch as Jesus leaves the courtyard through the east gate and back out to the town of Bethany with the twelve, where they will lodge again for the night. You turn to walk back in the dark to your family. And once again, you will wake up early and wait for Jesus and his disciples to come back into the city tomorrow morning. You close your eyes again softly as you whisper the Shema as you watch him leave. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be the name of our God and his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Let the words that God commands to me be in my heart. Help me teach his words diligently to my children, family, and friends. Help me speak of them when I'm at home and when I walk along the way, when I lie down, and when I rise up. Amen and amen. Staying in prayer for another moment, you silently reflect on what you've learned today, what you've seen, and what it means for your life today. What might it mean even for your life tomorrow? Consider that now in prayer. You walk off into the dark with plans to be at the fig tree by sunrise. You whisper goodnight as your rabbi leaves. It's early Tuesday morning. Once again, you find yourself sitting in darkness on top of the Mount of Olives, sitting in the dark of night, searching for the light of day. You're sitting at the base of the cedar tree next to the fig tree that Jesus cursed yesterday. As light crawls silently over the cities of Bethany and Bethpage below, you wait patiently again for Jesus. You take a deep, cleansing breath and softly whisper your morning prayer. Dear Lord God, I offer thanks to you, living and eternal King, for you have mercifully restored my soul within me. Your faithfulness is great, and the gift you've given me in meeting this rabbi is amazing. All thanks to you. Amen and amen. You take a moment longer in silence and ponder the gift of this rabbi, of this teacher, of this divine gift from God. Imagine it now. As you slowly and softly open your eyes, you blink as you adjust to the early morning light. Then, through the cedar trees, you hear Jesus and his disciples walking towards you. As they pass by, his disciples see the fig tree still withered away to its roots. One of the disciples says to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed. You watch as Jesus slowly turns and says, Peter, and the rest of you, Listen to me. If you have faith and don't doubt, I promise that you can do whatever I did to this tree, and you will be able to do even more. You can tell this mountain to get up and jump into the sea, and it will. If you have faith when you pray, 
you will be given whatever you ask for. You wonder if you heard him correctly. If I have faith and don't doubt, I can make a fig tree wither. I can make a mountain jump into the sea. And all I ask in prayer will be given to me. Faith in what? Faith in who? You feel at peace in the presence of Jesus, but his words confuse you. You want to believe his words, but you've never heard anything like them before. You softly close your eyes and pray as you heard him say, Dear Lord God, give me faith. Help me to not doubt. Accept the teachings of this new teacher. Help me believe in what he is saying. And help me with the confidence that his teachings might change and transform me. Amen and amen. You rest a little longer in quiet meditation for a few more moments, hoping his words are true and reaching to embrace the promise of Jesus. As you slowly and softly open your eyes, you realize they've already moved down the trail to the east gate of Jerusalem. You race after them, not wanting to miss a word Jesus has to say. You bolt through the city gates and find Jesus and his disciples near the temple. Several chief priests and scribes and elders approach Jesus. You hear them ask him, By what authority? Are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus answers them, I will ask you one question and answer me, and I will then tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? They seem confused by the question. They turn to discuss it amongst themselves for a moment. Finally, they turn and answer Jesus by saying, (laughs) We don't know. You silently laugh at their response. Then you hear Jesus say to them, Well, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. What a brilliant answer. Then one of the Pharisees approaches and asks him a question to test him. He asks Jesus, Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. The questions never stopped. They went on all day. They were unrelenting. And Jesus stumped them with each answer. No one was able to answer him a word. No one dared to ask him any more questions. And when the crowd heard it, they were astonished at his teaching. As you rest in the shadows at the edge of the temple court, you close your eyes to ponder what you saw and heard. Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And... You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all of the law and the prophets. You think for a moment. You thought your salvation was based on following all of the laws. But Jesus is saying no. First, love God and love your neighbors. You ponder that in prayer. Is that easier or harder than following a set of rules. As your eyes open, you hear several of the disciples telling Jesus that some people from Greece had come to see him. Jesus answers them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will keep it 
for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there will be my servant also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You are astonished at this. Is Jesus saying that he is about to die? How does he know? You feel all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind softening, wanting to follow Jesus, wanting to desire Jesus, to serve Jesus. You want somehow to be a part of what Jesus said, for the Lord God's name to be glorified through Jesus. And then suddenly, a tremendous roaring sound like crashing thunder splits open the temple court. A voice from above, a voice from heaven, and it says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stands there with you and hears it is astonished. So are you. You drop your face in your hands again to thank God that his name will be exalted, will be glorified, and somehow Jesus will be a part of it happening. You ponder it for several moments in prayer, and you do this now. As you open your eyes, still in quiet, reverent awe, you listen to Jesus tell a story after heavenly story of beautiful, profound, and divine truths. With each story and parable, you become more and more certain He is the One. He is the Messiah that your parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, and countless generations told was coming. And here He is with you, and you with Him, and you never want the day to end. But he finally pauses and looks closely into the eyes of his disciples and whispers to them, You know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. What? No, no. Please, God, no. The Messiah has come to save us. No, he can't die. Why must he die? Why? You stand up and run across the temple court, trying to hide. You are shaking as you kneel and pray to God, Why must Jesus die? Why? Your mind aching for answers. Pause now as you imagine it now. Suddenly, you hear voices. You look up to see the open window of the palace above you. You hear the voices of the chief priests and the elders gathered in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Caiaphas. The purpose of their secret meeting was unmistakable. They are plotting together in order to secretly arrest Jesus and kill him. You hear them say, Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. No, no, you can't let this happen. You race back over to tell Jesus and the disciples, but they're gone. Are they back in Bethany? Are they in the city of Bethpage? Are they somewhere camping on the Mount of Olives? You remember overhearing his disciples discussing yesterday that Jesus said he would suffer many things at the hands of the elders the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. You thought nothing of it at the time. You thought it was just another parable. But could it be true? You return home in the dark, committed to finding Jesus in the morning. You end your day thanking God again for the gift of Jesus praising God for what he will bring you tomorrow. 
and praying the conversation you overheard about the plot to arrest and kill Jesus was nothing more than that, the wishful thinking of some wild men. Maybe, you pray, maybe it will go no further. Maybe the priests will focus on the Passover and drop this insane idea. But tomorrow you must tell one of his disciples. You remember that you know the Iscariot family is prominent in Jerusalem. You have seen Simon Iscariot's son following Jesus. His son's name is Judas, you think. Tomorrow, hopefully, you will see Judas and tell him of the plot you've uncovered. Maybe Judas can help. You ponder the role of Judas as you walk into the darkness of the city. It's Wednesday morning. The sun is already rising and casting long shadows in your room. The anticipation, the excitement that has driven you to race to the top of the Mount of Olives, it's missing this morning. You don't know why. It's been replaced by fear, dread. You sense a darkness looming. You can almost feel it and hear it, like the sound of distant thunder. Your thoughts become consumed by the conversation you overheard yesterday afternoon in the temple court, under the open window of the palace of Caiaphas, the high priest. The conversation between the chief priests and the elders plotting together in order to secretly arrest Jesus and kill him. You heard their concern about the timing of hatching this plot during the upcoming Passover feast in just a few days. They hope to avoid an uproar among the people. You close your eyes for morning prayer, your thoughts turning back to Jesus, the panic in your heart over losing him, the desire that you have to learn as much as you can from him. You breathe deeply seeking God's peace as you take several moments to pray about this humble rabbi. As your eyes open, you remember your idea from last night to tell one of his disciples about what you've learned. You know the Iscariot family is prominent in Jerusalem. You have seen Simon Iscariot's son following Jesus. His son's name is Judas. You climb out of bed and consider whether Judas can help you. You step out into the morning light and walk towards the temple courtyard. You stop as you see the leading priests and captains of the temple guard walking back into Caiaphas's palace. You take off running towards the open window of the palace to see if you can hear the conversation again. With your eyes glued to the window as you run, you don't notice as you run headlong into someone else. You both fall to the ground in a heap. As you both stand up to straighten your clothes and wipe off the dirt, you notice it's Judas. You leap up to introduce yourself and tell him you're hoping to talk to him this morning. As you look at his face, You see darkness in his eyes. Darkness like you've never seen before. Darker than the coal of your fire and cold. Colder than the most bitter winter night. Judas walks on without saying a word. Walking through the courtyard, following the priests into the secret rooms of the palace, almost as though he was possessed, guided by something dark, someone dark, as though Satan himself had entered him. As you walk towards the open window of the palace, you pray as you walk. Your heart is racing and you feel afraid. You feel you are witnessing the beginning of a chain of events. You don't yet know where it's going, but you pray. You take several moments to pray, ponder, and meditate over what you just saw. 
What seemingly small, insignificant decisions do you make each day that may have devastating effects later? You imagine it in prayer. You slide in unnoticed under the open window. You can hear the conversation inside. They are moving ahead with the plot to kill and arrest Jesus. They're concerned over the timing, and they are frustrated that they can't find Jesus. They agreed they need someone close to him that can tell them how to find Jesus and find him quickly. Suddenly, you hear Judas enter their meeting. They begin discussing the best way for him to betray Jesus. They are delighted. Judas asks them, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him over to you? You listen as they count out for him 30 pieces of silver. You hear a pause, and then Judas agrees to begin looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they can arrest him when the crowds aren't around. You fall to the ground, sobbing, kneeling in the dirt as you pray. How could this be happening? Just three days ago, you were a tired traveler walking to Jerusalem with your family for Passover, hoping that this feast would bring change in your life, peace, hope. And you find it in the eyes of a humble rabbi. And now it might all be taken away from you. Why? Why must this happen? Why must he die? For whom must he die? What has he done wrong? With your face buried in your hands, you ponder those questions in prayer. You spend the rest of the day searching for Judas to stop him. You search, too, for Jesus and his other disciples. No luck. You turn back to walk home to your family. Tomorrow is going to be a long day. A day of preparation for the Passover meal. Preparing the lamb to be sacrificed. You stop for a moment. You realize how much the lamb and Jesus have in common. They are both innocent. They are both so pure. And they are both walking into certain death. And for what purpose? For what purpose? As you walk into the dark, your thoughts focus on tomorrow. The thoughts of pending sacrifice. It's Thursday morning. You sleep in a little later today. It will be a long day. It's Passover, a special moment each year to celebrate the exodus from Egypt and the Israelites' freedom from Egyptian slavery. As a Jew, you grew up hearing the stories from Exodus chapter 12, how God told the Israelites to sacrifice a spotless lamb and mark their doorposts with its blood. During the 10th plague, when the Lord passed through the nation, he would pass over the households that showed the blood. As you think about it now, as an adult, the blood of the lamb saved the Israelites from death that day. It saved your family. The blood of the lamb saves you. Your thoughts turn to Jesus again this morning. How much he has in common with the spotless lamb, both innocent, both pure, and unwitting participants in the events of the day. But today will be filled with preparations, rituals, celebrations, and a Seder meal with your family and friends. It seems every square inch of Jerusalem is filled with people preparing for the feast, under every tree and in every room. You begin your day praying for your family, for the celebration, and for remembering the blessings God has given you. Remembering, too, the Rabbi Jesus, hoping he has friends with him today and perhaps can maybe eat a Seder meal.
together in a certain man's home. You stay there in prayer with thoughts of Jesus and the Lamb. After a long day, it is late in the evening as you're walking back through the city after the Seder meal with your family. Candle lights are glowing inside every home, every room. You hear soft conversations and muted laughter from the families as you walk past each home. You stop, though, as you walk by one home. You recognize the voices. It's Jesus and his disciples in an upper room of a home. Finally, you have found them. You race up the side stairs and peek into the room. They are still eating, finishing their meal. You look around the table, and Judas is among them. You feel anger and rage and hatred building in you. You want to burst into the room, but you watch as Jesus slowly rises from supper. He lays aside his outer coat and takes a towel and ties it around his waist. He then takes a basin and kneels in front of each disciple to wash and wipe their feet. What rabbi washes his disciples' feet? They should be washing his. Is there no depth to this man's humility? Jesus then tells them that since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Now do as I have done to you. But then he tells them, Here in this room there is one who eats my food but has turned against me. Wow! Jesus knows Judas is going to betray him. Jesus turns to Judas and tells him, Hurry and do what you're going to do. And Judas leaves but not until Jesus washes his feet too. Seriously, is there no depth to this man's humility? That Jesus is willing to give himself up in service to someone who deserves none of what Jesus is offering? You stop there as you ask yourself that question. Are you worthy of what you have learned from Jesus? Are you worthy of his love? What if Jesus knew everything about you? But then you realize, Jesus obviously knows everything about Judas, but there he is washing his feet. You close your eyes as you ponder that. Pray about that in quiet, mindful meditation. You open your eyes as you hear Jesus end their Seder by taking some bread and blessing it and breaking it as he gives it to his disciples. He tells them, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. Then Jesus takes a cup of wine and gives thanks to God for it. He gives it to them and says, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. You were stunned. Did he just say what you thought he said? Is he the life-giving, sustaining bread of life? Is his blood the blood of the new covenant? The same sacrificial blood that just tonight you celebrated would bring salvation, but not from a lamb. You close your eyes again to reflect on what you've heard, that Jesus is the bread of life and that his blood can bring salvation. And it was true. He is here to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus is the Lamb. 
you take a deep breath as you meditate on Jesus. Your eyes open as you hear them all getting up from dinner. They follow Jesus out the door and down the stairs into the night. Walking right by you, they disappear into the darkness of a vineyard across the road. You hesitate following them. But how can you stop now? You follow close enough to hear them, but hiding to avoid being seen. Lit only by the moon, you see Jesus stop at a grapevine. He reaches out to hold it tenderly in his hands as he speaks to them. He tells them he is the true vine and his father is the gardener. He cuts away every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, but he trims clean every branch that does produce fruit so it will produce even more fruit. You are already clean, he says, because of what I have said to you. Abide in me now. Stay joined to me, and I will stay joined to you. Just as a branch cannot produce fruit unless it stays joined to the vine, you cannot produce fruit unless you stay joined to me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you stay joined to me, and I stay joined to you, then you will produce lots of fruit but you cannot do anything without me. If you don't stay joined to me, you will be thrown away. You will be like dry branches that are gathered up and burned in a fire. So abide in me, stay joined to me, and let my teachings become part of you. Then you can pray for whatever you want, and your prayer will be answered. When you become fruitful disciples of mine, my Father will be honored. You are shaking as you hear him speak. He is the bread. He is the lamb. He is divine. And his blood will save. Peter is the first to speak. He says, Jesus, I will never fall away. I will always abide in you. I will never deny you. You see Jesus turn to Peter. You see doubt in Jesus' eyes. He says to Peter, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows in the morning, you will deny me three times. You feel anger towards Peter. How could Peter ever deny what he has heard from Jesus? But then you reflect. You yourself denied and doubted at first. You are still weak at times. How far are you willing to go to follow and abide in Jesus? Are you willing to give your life for this rabbi? What sacrifice are you willing to make? Don't judge Peter too quickly. You close your eyes again in prayer. When you open your eyes, you realize they have all disappeared into the dark. You try to follow them by the moonlight, stopping and listening for voices, but there is nothing but silence. You pray to God that you can find them. You continue to walk through the vineyard. You find a gate. You pass through the gate and enter an estate of olive trees. You stop and listen again. You hear whispering. You approach slowly. Peering through the olive trees, you see Jesus kneeling next to a stone and praying. You are frozen as you hear him pray. My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but you will. You see tears and sweat pouring from him as he slowly stands. You watch as he walks over to his disciples and finds them sleeping. He wakes them and asks, So could you not watch me for one hour? Watch and pray that you might not enter into temptation. 
The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He sighs deeply as he returns to his prayer. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. He leaves to wake his disciples, then returns a third time in prayer to his father. You have never seen anything more beautiful. You cry too as you listen. What is it that Jesus is wanting his father to take from him? Could it be his death? Suddenly, from among the olive trees, you see Judas approaching. You smile, so thankful that Judas has changed his mind, that he has decided to return to Jesus and his fellow disciples. You are so pleased to see Judas lean over to kiss Jesus on the cheek. Suddenly, the woods around you explode with priests, Pharisees, a contingent of Roman soldiers and temple guards rushing in to surround Jesus, to arrest him. You realize Judas is betraying Jesus. Peter is the first to move. He draws his sword and strikes the servant of the high priest and cuts off his ear. Jesus tells Peter to stop. Put your sword back into its place. You watch as Jesus turns slowly and looks to those that have found him and asks, Who are you looking for? The chief priest says, We seek Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus then says, I am he. As Jesus said, I am he, they all draw back and fall to the ground. Those two words, I am, you recognize them. It's the words God used in Exodus to describe himself, to name himself to Moses. Jesus just used them to identify himself. The words have the power to knock them to the ground, the power to change lives. This rabbi is indeed the Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh. You are frozen as you ponder the truth and shocked to watch as all the disciples leave Jesus and flee. You fall to your knees in prayer. Are you any better than his disciples? How will you respond in the face of such a threat? How will you respond? Whisper your answer to Jesus as you watch them bind his hands and lead him off into the dark. All alone in the garden, you curl up next to the stone where Jesus wept and prayed. You stay there in prayer too. Now as today becomes tomorrow, you weep, not knowing what the rest of the night will bring, but you remain in prayer to God. How will you respond? It's early Friday morning, well past midnight, still hours before the dawn. You finally find the strength to stand. You lean on the stone beside you, still wet with the drops of Jesus' tears. You have no strength to go on. You were alone in the garden. The priests, Pharisees, Roman soldiers, and temple guards, all gone. Judas disappeared. Jesus' disciples, they took off running to every point on the compass hours ago. And Jesus is gone. You thought you heard one of the soldiers say they were taking him to first see Annas, the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest. You know where that is, and that's where you will start. You don't have the strength, but neither do you have a choice. You have to see this through. You walk through the olive trees, then back through the vineyard where Jesus had told his disciples, had told you, to stay with him, abide with him. You walk faster. You start to run. You enter the city and see Peter has returned and following Jesus with another disciple. The other disciple 
enters the inner courtyard with Jesus, but Peter stands just outside the door. A servant girl is standing near the door with temple servants and officers. They had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. You hear the servant girl say to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? You whisper to yourself, No, Peter, don't do it. But Peter says to her, I am not. Your heart sinks. You imagine Peter will never forget that moment, the smell of that charcoal fire. You wonder what Peter is thinking. You silently slip behind the guards and enter the inner courtyard. You watch the priest question Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answers him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he says that, one of the officers standing by strikes Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that not how you answer the priest? Jesus answers him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Anasin sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Hiding in the dark, you wonder that yourself. Has Jesus done anything in secret? Has he wanted everyone to hear? You've heard his teaching. What would you tell Jesus right now if you could? Whisper it to him in prayer. You open your eyes as they lead Jesus out of the inner courtyard, bound in chains. They take him to Caiaphas, the high priest. You are certain the scribes and the elders had already gathered. You follow them. You stop to look over your shoulder and see Peter following too at a distance. As you approach the palace of Caiaphas, you hear the screaming before you even enter the gates. The scribes and elders are yelling amongst themselves for any sign of testimony they can use against Jesus so they can put him to death. And they find none. The yelling grows louder as they drag Jesus before the council. Still, they find no evidence. And through it all, you can't take your eyes off of Jesus, standing bound before them, silent, utterly silent. Finally, Caiaphas yells out at him. He screams at Jesus, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus slowly lifts his head and looks at him. With boldness, Jesus tells Caiaphas, You have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. All eyes immediately turn to Caiaphas. He tears his robes and screams, He has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? In unison, the council answers, He deserves death. As they drag Jesus from the palace to go see Governor Pilate, you notice Peter standing at the door. Another servant girl sees him. She says, This man, he was with Jesus of Nazareth. You whisper to yourself again, Peter, no, please, no. But Peter turns to the servant girl, and again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. You fall against the wall, broken over Peter's second denial, broken by what you witnessed in front of Caiaphas in the council. But somehow, you're at peace, hearing this rabbi, your rabbi, finally say what you've known in your heart, that he is the Christ, the Son of God. You close your eyes again, wishing you were with him again in the garden, 
where you could tell him you believe, that you accept, but tell him now in your whispered prayer. You open your eyes and begin running to catch up to the crowds following the guards carrying Jesus to Pilate. You notice that Peter is walking up in front of you. Several people gather around him. They say to him, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. You scream out to Peter, No, Peter, don't, no. But he can't hear you. You hear Peter begin to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. Somewhere in the distance you hear it. As the sun slowly begins to climb over Jerusalem, this cold Friday morning you hear it. A rooster crowing. Peter hears it too. He walks away from the crowd, falls to the ground, and weeps bitterly. You cry too, watching him. Your eyes and attention turn back to the crowd, carrying Jesus to the governor's headquarters. You watch as Pilate comes outside and asks, What accusation do you bring against this man before me? The priests answer, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. But Pilate says, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews say to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. Pilate then asks Jesus, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answers, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answers, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answers, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. Then Pilate says to him, So you're a king? Jesus answers, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate says to him, What is truth? After he says this, he comes back outside to the Jews and tells them, I find no guilt in him, nor does King Herod. You feel relieved. You want to cheer in celebration until Governor Pilate speaks further. I'm accustomed to release for you one prisoner whoever you want. So whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? With no hesitation, the ground around you shakes as the crowd shouts, Barabbas, free Barabbas. Then Pilate says to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? Again the ground shakes. Let him be crucified, they yell. You collapse to your knees. His fate is sealed. Today, Rabbi will be crucified. Today, the Lamb, the innocent Lamb. You feel the weight of it as you pray. What words do you find? Your eyes open as you hear the screams of the crowd around you and the soldiers of the governor stripping off Jesus' clothes. You watch in horror as they place a scarlet robe on him and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. They put a reed in his hand and kneeling before him, they mock him saying, Hail, hail King of the Jews. And they spit on him. And they take the reed and strike him on the head. They then put his clothes back on and lead him away to crucify him. You watch as they force Jesus to carry his own cross. You rush to his aid, but are stopped by the guards. 
you beg for them to let you help. Instead, they find a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compel him to carry his cross. And slowly, Jesus, Simon, the guards, and the crowd inch up the hill to a dreaded patch of rocky ground called the Place of the Skull, Golgotha. They lay his tattered, torn, and bloody frame on the cross. You look away as they grip his hands and feet, driving stakes through his flesh. You hear his screams, screams of pain, but not release. You remember his tears in the garden. The cup is not passing from him. His father's will is being done. Screams of pain and acceptance. They nail a sign above his head that reads, This is the king of the Jews, as they lift the cross high in the air. Your head tilted back as you look up at Jesus, tears streaming down your face as you squint into the white, hot midday sun. Why? Why, God? Why him? Why now? What did he do to deserve this? Why must he die? As you peer into his face, the answer to why settles on your heart, piercing it. He is the lamb. He is the sacrifice. Why? You. You are why he must die. You slowly fall to your knees. The brightness of the midday sun fades into darkness around you. You remember the last few days watching the morning light invade the dark of night. As you surrender yourself in prayer, it feels like now darkness is invading the light of day. For three hours, you pray in darkness before your rabbi, your teacher, and yes, your Lord, your Savior, Jesus the Christ. Feel it now as you take all the time you need, afraid to open your eyes for what you might see. For three hours you've prayed, kneeling in darkness in complete silence before the cross. Even though it is sometime in the late afternoon, the sun has vanished. Only darkness remains, darkness and silence. As long as there is breath within him, you can't bring yourself to leave. When suddenly you hear him moan. Jesus cries out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then he adds, It is finished. He bows his head and gives up his spirit. You are frozen as you look at him. That's sudden. He had warned all who would listen. Now it's finished. He prayed for another way. Now it's done. And you slowly embrace the weight of it, the purpose of it, his sacrifice, his willingness, his plan all along to be the lamb, the lamb for you in your place. Bow here. Resist finding the words. Just bow here in silence as you accept the truth of his sacrifice. Your eyes open as you notice two men approach the guards and ask for the body of Jesus. The first identifies himself as Joseph from the town of Arimathea and a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin High Council. The other man identifies himself as Nicodemus, a Pharisee, and also a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin High Council. They tell the guards they have come from a meeting with the Roman governor Pilate and have been given permission to remove and bury the body of Jesus. You watch in agony as the guards lower the lifeless body of Jesus. Joseph K. 
carefully wraps Jesus' body in soft white linen. Nicodemus brings a 75-pound mixture of myrrh and aloes to prepare Jesus for burial. You watch in their eyes the love, the care, the devotion they have for him. You are moved. You consider the weight they must have felt, both being on the Jewish high council, the guilt of not stopping what they had the power to stop, the shame they must carry now as they carry Jesus to Joseph's tomb. You consider your own guilt too, your own shame of what Jesus did for you, the reason for his execution. You, you are the reason. Joseph and Nicodemus are the reason. You think back a few nights before, watching as Jesus washed the feet of the one who would betray him. Yet, he washed. Understanding now that his death washed your feet, washed your soul, washed Joseph's, washed Nicodemus's. You pray as you watch them leave with the body of Jesus. How do you feel? Empty? Alone? Or hopeful? And at peace? Whisper your answer. You follow Joseph and Nicodemus down the path to the tomb. You notice Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are there, sitting opposite the tomb. The two men place the body of Jesus in the tomb, and then they roll a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and walk away. You consider for a moment the gift that Joseph had made. He must be wealthy to afford such a tomb. That suddenly reminds you of the stories that your father and grandfather had told you in countless generations before. Stories from the prophet Isaiah about the coming Messiah. And you realize you have lived through each of them over the last few days. How Jesus was despised and rejected by men. He was indeed a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely Jesus bore our grief and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But yes, but yes, Jesus was pierced for our transgressions. Yes, Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. And upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. Yes, all like sheep we have gone astray. We have turned every one to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Yes, Jesus was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like sheep that before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, Jesus was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living and stricken for the transgression of my people. And here you are realizing that, yes, the Father has made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man, Joseph, in his death. Although Jesus had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord, his Father, to crush him. He has put him to grief for you. You remember the prophet Isaiah. You stay a little longer as night falls over the sealed tomb, racking your brain for what he said a few days earlier, that on the third day, Is it even right to hope? Is it right to believe? You walk back home. It's been a long, emotional, draining day. But for now, you leave Friday behind. A day of loss. But for all that you've seen 
and finally understood, it is a good Friday, too. Perhaps you will come back tomorrow, Saturday, to rest and pray at the tomb. You pray softly as you leave, thanking God for Jesus, praising Him for the gift of His sacrifice and for your salvation. It is early Saturday morning as the rising sun wakes you from your sleep and just for a moment you forget. And then suddenly, like a torrent, the memories come flooding back, a mixture of grief and hope, loss and discovery. You take your time, but soon enough you find yourself at the tomb of Joseph, the rich, kind, good man from the city of Arimathea, the member of the Sanhedrin, the Jewish High Council. There is no one at the tomb. All is quiet this morning. You wonder what Joseph must be feeling this morning, and what of Nicodemus. You are surprised that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary aren't at the tomb. Then you remember, it's the Sabbath, and by law, they are home resting. You begin to kneel in prayer when you hear a small crowd approaching. You quickly hide behind a grove of cedar trees. You peek around them to see several chief priests and Pharisees. They are discussing what Jesus had said while he was still alive, that after three days he will rise. They all agree that the tomb has to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people, look, he's risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. They leave to visit with Caiaphas to convince him to seal the tomb. Once they are gone, you walk slowly to the tomb, to the stone that covers the entrance. So they heard it too. They heard Jesus say that he would rise from the dead on Sunday. But it's Saturday now. But Sunday is coming. You place your hand on the stone. Yes, Sunday is coming. Your eyes close in prayer. A prayer of hope. A prayer of belief. You ponder it and meditate on it. Today is Saturday, but Sunday. But Sunday is coming. How does the hope feel that is building up in you? Take all the time you need and cherish that. Pray it to God. As you open your eyes, you see guards standing around you. They push you aside as they seal the tomb and then station themselves all across the front of the stone. They tell you to leave. And you smile. You almost laugh as you look at the seal. You look at the guards and whisper to them, Tomorrow, tomorrow is Sunday. Tomorrow is the third day. Sunday is coming. You will see. Sunday is coming. How do you feel as you walk back home? How do you feel about tomorrow, Sunday? How early will you be at the tomb? As you walk, pray your thoughts back to God. Your eyes open. You sit up with a jolt. What time is it? How long have you been asleep? You look out your window to see the moon and the stars. You look to the east and see no sign of the sunrise. You take several moments to reflect on your week. How a week ago, last Sunday, you were awake at this point, climbing up to the top of the Mount of Olives, wanting to see the sunrise, wanting to see the morning sun light the city of David, and wanting the sun to warm your heart too. Now a week later, here you are, 
waiting on the sun in the sky to peek over the eastern horizon, but knowing the Son of God was already in your heart, your mind, and your soul. A week ago, you were hoping for change, and Jesus, the humble rabbi and Son of God, had changed and transformed your soul this week. You squint again as you look to the east. Yes, there it is, the faint, distant glow of the morning sun. You throw on your coat and sandals and run out into the cold morning air. The cold Sunday morning air. Running to the tomb of Joseph. Running like the wind through the twists and turns of the streets of the ancient city of David. As you round the last corner, you see them. You've been beaten. You aren't alone. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary are already at the tomb to repair the body of Jesus. You are about to approach them when suddenly there's a huge earthquake. It throws you to the ground. You look as an angel of the Lord descends from heaven and comes to roll back the stone and sits on it. His appearance is like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards tremble, become like dead men. But the angel says to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. But he is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. He tells them now to go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee, and there you will see him. So Mary Magdalene and the other Mary run quickly from the tomb to find and tell his disciples. You run with them, with both fear and great joy. Just slightly up the trail, you see the two women stop and speak to a gardener. As you approach, you hear him ask, Women, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Mary then accuses the gardener of taking away the body of Jesus. She begs him to tell her where he has taken the body. You look at the gardener. You look into his eyes. You've seen the eyes before. You've seen the eyes in the man riding the donkey a week ago of the man crying as he prayed in the temple court, the eyes of a man crying to his Father in heaven, and the eyes of a Savior on the cross crying, It is finished. Jesus says to her, Mary. She turns and cries out to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, teacher. And behold, Jesus tells her, Greetings, Mary. And both women bow down to take hold of his feet and worship him. Then Jesus says to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. And with that, the two women leave. They leave, leaving you alone with Jesus. He walks by you slowly. The look in his eyes from a week ago before you first saw him on the donkey, when his eyes pierced your soul. You prayed then for another chance to greet him, to speak to him. And here it is. Take this moment. Pause for all the time you need. He has been waiting for this conversation with you. He has been waiting to hear from you. What is it you want to tell him? Feel his loving, forgiving, grace-filled arms around you as you whisper. Tell him who he is to you. Tell him everything. We hope this meditation brought you peace. To listen to the full collection of biblical bedtime stories, download the Abide app in the iTunes or Google Play Store.